The following is a hoop ball presentation. Welcome to the Fantasy NBA Today podcast. What's happening, everybody? Welcome to Fantasy NBA Today. It's Wednesday. Coming off a two-game Tuesday card that solidified a couple of things, brought a couple things into the forefront, and obviously uh, thrilled because Wednesday is also a time where we get to move away from just covering the boxes, the results, for a couple of minutes. So that'll be coming up hopefully later on in the program. Uh, I am Dan Bespris, D-A-N-B-E-S-B-R-I-S. Again, Fantasy NBA Today is a hoop ball, hoop-ball.com and a Hawaiian Isles Kona Coffee Company presentation. HawaiianIsles.com is the website. H-I Kona Coffee on Twitter or just search for Hawaiian Isles on Amazon.com. I uh, want to start out the show by, again, reiterating that Hoop Ball is building out our sales team. We've had some wonderful folks come forward uh, and ask about getting involved in it. And, and I'm in discussion with, I, I think, every one of you guys. If you, if you sent us something and you haven't heard from me, uh, send it again. That means that it disappeared someplace. If it's Twitter, then hopefully I didn't miss it. Uh, but hit me up, at Dan Bespris, or send an email to teamhoopball at hoop-ball.com. Team Hoop Ball is all one word, uh, at hoop-ball.com. Again, we are building out our sales team. You need midday availability. That is important. Obviously, you can't do sales at like 9 o'clock at night uh, unless you're in Europe, in which case then it's like, you know, 2 in the afternoon out here. So it, uh, operating on Pacific time, you need Pacific time availability. doesn't matter where you are, but we are, again, operating on the West Coast. So hit me up. That should be a lot of fun. Uh, and if you want to contribute in some other ways, we can do that as well. You can get in touch with us the very same way. Writing, podcasting, marketing, social, all that good stuff. Hit us up post-haste. Uh, Tuesday evening, this is the calm before the storm before the ultra calm because tonight we have the Insano card, and we'll obviously talk about that a little bit later on in the program. And then Thursday, there's nothing because it's Thanksgiving. So this is the everybody take a breath, and then everybody play, and then nobody gets to play. Uh, tomorrow, or excuse me, to, yeah, tomorrow being Thanksgiving, I'll, I'll, there will be a show here, Fantasy NBA Today. We'll have an episode where we cover the results from this Wednesday card. For Tuesday, the Clippers went into Dallas and laser-focused on Luka Doncic. I mean, that's really the story of this ball game was slow Luka, and then Dallas is just not the same team. Doncic, 22-8-6 with three steals, so he still was able to put up some good stuff in the counting numbers, but, and good free throw shooting as well, 14 out of 16, seven turnovers and 29% from the field. They they keyed in on him. They sent multiple people his way. They gave him different looks. He, he needed Kristaps Porzingis to do more than he did. Porzingis, bad at the free throw line, bad from the field. He has not been very good so far this year. There was, and I don't know that, I mean, he's been fine, 2.2 blocks per game, 18-9, and nine, but the free throw is down. Uh, that, that, I think, is not what we expected. He was closer to 80% most of his short career so far, and he's down closer to 70 this year. Field goal percent has always been kind of low, and with the way the NBA is trending, everybody moving farther away, that has not held up as well. So I, I think a lot of folks, if you drafted KP, you were hoping for that like monster per-game number with some potential rest days. To his credit... I think he's only taken one rest day so far. Now, in the defense of how that's happened, I think the Mavericks have only had one back-to-back. Is that possible? Maybe he skipped one earlier on in the season that I'm forgetting, so maybe two. Uh, but they've been relatively low on the back-to-back situation so far. That That's kept him on the floor. But listen, this team goes as Luka goes. He's been unbelievable so far this year. And the Clippers said, look, we're going to give you a taste of what it's like to go against some of the best defenders in the NBA, all looking at you. So Paul George, you're on Luka. Kawhi, you're on Luka. You guys just deal with him, and we'll figure this thing out from there. And they had a really good game plan. The Clippers executed it. They are continuing to pile up wins. This was, to me, probably their most impressive win of the year for L.A. because they took a team that was playing well, and they made them look not very good. Lakers 15 and 2, Nuggets 13 and 3. They won their late game, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Clippers 13 and 5. Uh, and the top of the West appears to be 
sliding away a little bit. The Rockets are on a short losing streak right now. Schedule's getting easier and harder for a lot of these teams. That obviously plays a big role. Um, I think you're going to start to see the Lakers dial it back just a tiny bit. I know they're they're sort of rolling right now, um, but they're going to start thinking about getting their guys healthy. To, to pile up 15 wins in the first 17 games, they just they couldn't have this go any better. And for the Clippers, things are now going better for them as well. Remember just a moment ago, they were 7-5. and five. They've rattled off six consecutive wins. They're 11-1 and one at home. This was a decisive road victory. And so I think they'll probably keep up with their plan of giving guys particular days off for rest as well. Montrez Harrell has looked a tiny bit slowed. I, I mean, he was a guy that always seemed like a decent mid-range center, and he's been fine so far. Um, he had a huge ball game in their last one against New Orleans. I mean, he's going to pick some of those teams apart. Uh, I see no reason to to back off what's been a nice season for him so far. Lou Williams, uh, just, you know, th- there's, I think, a disconnect with Lou between what he does and where he's valued. He's number 96 in nine category leagues right now on the very hefty shoulders of an intensely good field goal, or sorry, free throw percent. 22 points and six assists, but there really isn't much else for Sweet Lou. And so he's a guy that I think carries more trade value from name than actual fantasy value. But that said, he does belong on your fantasy team. He is very much their third option, and he's going to get plenty of looks because Kawhi Leonard's going to take games off. They want to keep his minutes close to 30 anyway. I think they probably want to do the same thing with Paul George. So there's going to be a lot of Lou because he's not on those same restrictions Ivica Zubats, 11 and 7. Uh, and, you know, he, he's, a, he's an interesting case study because I keep saying I just can't trust a guy playing 16 minutes a game. And not surprisingly, he has sort of fallen off lately. You know, he was a guy that was hovering right around the top 100 for the first three weeks of the year. He's been much worse than that over the last two weeks. He's outside the top 200 in that stretch. Free throw percent has tailed off, blocks have tailed off, rebounds have tailed off. The field goal percent is always going to be solid for him, but it needs to be intensely good for him to have the kind of value that he's being treated as right now. He's pretty damn heavily owned in my fantasy leagues. And again, he's like number 140 something. So uh, I said it early. I'll say it again. He's just not a guy I trust because he's not playing enough. If someone said, if he's a is going to get 24 minutes, do you want him? I'd say, hell yeah. But he's playing 16, 17 minutes a game. It's just not enough, and I don't see it trending up as long as they're playing in competitive basketball games. What this game also taught us, I think, is that there's just no one else on the Dallas Mavericks that deserves to be used. Um, I I said we had to pick up Tim Hardaway just to see what happens next. You got to like the 29 minutes he played in this game. But what you don't like, the eight shots. He just, the usage was super low, lower than Dwight freaking Powell in this one. He did get three steals, so that's good, but only one rebound, one assist, and again, you need him taking shots if he's going to be effective. He needs to get points because the other stuff is going to be like, oh, okay, well, you know, I'm on the floor enough for it to be relevant. Uh, he's owning every single one of my leagues as well, uh, a few of them by me, and you know, I just, you can give them one more game. They're going to go play Phoenix after Thanksgiving. If you want to hold on that long, that's totally fine. There aren't that many other guys that are worth picking up at the moment. Uh, but, I mean, to me, this was this was a pretty solid downward signal because J.J. Barea even got 11 shots in his time on the floor, and the Mavericks are incredibly hard to trust. Dorian Finney-Smith was a guy that I kept kind of clowning on despite he had a couple of good ball games mixed in. His percentages are not good. He'll get you some of those hustle stats, but he just does nothing offensively when he's on the floor. Seth Curry is the backup, even though he had a decent ball game. Dwight Powell actually had a slightly better game, but there's just no rebounds for him. So I am advocating dropping every Maverick that's not Luka or Kristaps Porzingis. I don't think there's a third guy on this team that's going to stay above the cut line. But again, I realize this is a very quick decision to make on Tim Hardaway Jr., the minutes that he got was a positive sign. If he plays 30 minutes a game, he'll probably end up with some fantasy value. And so if there's somebody that comes along that you pick up, otherwise um, you could probably sit on him for one more game, try to exercise a little bit of patience, but that's the best advice I can give on that front. 
Game two, Washington and Denver. Thomas Bryant, 10 and 8, with a couple steals and a couple blocks. Uh, but Washington was getting beat up in this game. And so ultimately, it, it was sort of blowout rules. Everybody except Bradley Beal played 25 minutes or less. Beal played 29. So Isaiah Thomas, 22. Uh, Jordan McRae, 24. He ended up with 21 points. A lot of that in garbage time, but he's been playing a little bit better lately. So uh, don't completely ignore him. I just. Again, there's a, there's a minutes issue going on here. He's at 20, 24, 24. He can sort of get hot. He can go fire hose style, but the rest of his game is at times lacking. And I think there's going to be a lot of bouncing around in Washington of who's actually getting shots and, and doing stuff with them. I'm okay with moving on from Isaiah Thomas. As long as he sits in the starting lineup, he's not going to be doing enough. Usage was at 22, which isn't terrible. But again, he's, he's points... He's assists and some three-pointers. Uh, the turnovers are too high. The free throw attempts by totals are too low. There's no defensive stats, but that was never going to be a thing. And so you just you need him to actually be in charge when he's on the floor, and he's not. He's playing alongside Bradley Beal for the most part, so he's going to be at the very best second fiddle, and it's going to be more like third or fourth because the big men have to eat a little bit after him. And Rui's going to take some shots. And Davis Bertans is going to come off the bench and take some shots. And so he just gets pushed farther and farther down the pecking order. And while I, I, I very much advocated picking him up early in the season, and it looked like he was sort of finding his form a little bit, as a starter, he's a wreck, and I'm okay with moving on there too. And when I say two, I mean in addition to the various Mavericks. At this point, I would rather hang on to Tim Hardaway Jr. than Isaiah Thomas because at least we're seeing here Timmy is getting minutes lately. Uh, and when the minutes are there, there are going to be some number of touches. Uh, but between the two, I don't think that either one really needs to be on your team. And, th and that's the that was the head-to-head -head battle. I give the edge to Hardaway. Um, but overall, I don't know that I am all that intense on, intent on keeping either of them. Will Barton played well again. Um, Jamal Murray was decent, if unspectacular. Jeremy Grant came off the bench for 28 minutes in a rare, I'm going to play more than Paul Millsap thing. Again, Gary Harris got plenty of time, but didn't do a whole lot with it. Jokic played 25 minutes at 8, 20, and 5 in a super weird fantasy line. And his oddly down season continues. But again, they didn't really need him because Washington isn't very good, and they had plenty of other guys to go get the job done. Still a buy-low situation on Jokic. Every game that he doesn't do something massive is a, a little bit closer to you being able to get him for, like, an overperforming third-rounder. Keep thinking on that. Maybe we'll maybe I'll ask Brandon about that. Maybe that'll be one of the guys we try to figure out where the right match is. Uh, are you picking up Jeremy Grant? Nah. I mean, this was a Millsap didn't play as well, so Grant got hot and got to stay on the floor a little bit longer, and then it rolled into garbage time, and apparently he and Will Barton were the guys that got to go clean things up a little bit. Go figure. There's going to have to be some homework uh, on this, this Wednesday card, and, oh boy, we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit, I suppose. Hey, look at this. What do we have here? It's a mid-show. Happy Brandon Day. Happy Brandon Day. I, I buried the lead today. I didn't open with Happy Brandon Day because I wasn't sure exactly on the timing. I knew with it is pouring rain in Southern California, which is super weird. So everybody, you know, the apocalypse is coming. And, and frankly, I didn't know when the hell I'd actually get back from preschool drop-off. So I, I sort of covered my bases by doing an opening that was like, I'm pretty sure Brandon's going to be on the show, but I might screw this up. So here's your not Brandon Day opening, but here we go. We got it anyway. How are you feeling, man? Any ailments? No, I'm well rested. I'm very well rested. Got to sleep today until 845. Damn. And uh, I haven't had that happen in quite some time. So it's, it's a good day. A great start to Brandon Day. Um, I don't have to be on the 405 today, which is even better. Oh. Uh, all those people, feel free to go on Twitter and look to see what the hell it looked like last night because it was a straight-up parking lot and uh, not great. And then LAX people are now protesting. So anybody that's trying to get into LAX last night, there was like a 15-minute like log jam where people weren't moving. People were getting out of their cars and just walking to the terminals. Yeah, don't don't oh. trap Wednesday or Tuesday. It's bad. What? Um, I don't want to get political on the show, but... What are they? Are they protesting all the uh, the Uber Lyft stuff that they've done down there? 
You know what's funny actually is that has turned around completely to a 180. It, that now works very well. I had a friend that oh. got out that got his bag at baggage claim and was in his Uber in 10 minutes. Oh my so, goodness. Yeah, they've done a really good job with that. No, it's um an airline employees that are protesting their wages. Oh, on Thanksgiving Wednesday. Yeah, that'll put a dent into it, man. That is if you want to get noticed, this is the day to do it. Um by the way, if you're if you're getting out of town, do it before lunchtime. Uh, it is, it's crazy. Whatever. I mean, we got listeners across the globe who are just like, what the hell are you talking about right now? But leaving, <laughs> leaving LA on Thanksgiving Wednesday is just the worst thing on earth. Um, and so we'll, uh, we'll just pretend that that's not a factor. Um, what's up otherwise, man? How was your last week? Last week has been good. Yeah. Last week has been good. You know, uh, happy almost Thanksgiving. Up. Yeah, the Clippers are doing well, so that's always nice. They, that was uh, a good win for them yesterday. That was yeah. a really good one. That was a uh, an ass kicking. That was. That. that was. That uh, was. They did a nice job on Doncic. They showed a lot of what they did against Harden, doubling him at the top of the key and making him pass the ball, and uh, made others try and beat them, and others did not beat them. No, I, think this, I mean it, it's to, a it's a tailor made recipe. The Mavs need a. They either need a second option who's playing better than Porzingis because yep. Kristaps has been not that great so far this year just from like an overall basketball standpoint that's fine I mean he didn't play for a season um so I wouldn't have expected him to to come in and just dominate right out of the shoot but percentages are really low for Kristaps um they need him to be able to do a little bit of creating or some kind of third option because the Clippers I think and obviously they have the personnel to do it with Kawhi and Paul George and, and not every team can boast even one guy of that defensive caliber but it did show I thought that if you just take the ball out of Doncic's hands the Mavericks are in a bit of a pickle you know you don't have to have the best defenders on earth to just make him give up the ball the having the better defenders made it a lot harder to find passing lanes and you know he's sort of constantly being harassed and and you know he'll overcome that against worse defenses even worse double teams but that was that was a team that was just like we circled this game and we are going to expose a team that's playing above themselves because they have a, a blossoming superstar so I, I thought I mean of all the Clippers games this year that one to me was the most decisive so I, I'm guessing you're feeling pretty damn good right now yeah, that was the best they've looked so far. And, I mean, can you imagine being Doncic, who comes down, he's picked up by PG, they switch, and Kawhi comes on him. <laughs> yeah, and they, were, and they were jumping him, man, too. There was, like, two, three guys that he was running into at every turn. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Yeah, it, it's fun to watch. Lou Williams looked good. Trez wasn't even that great. But, I mean, yeah. It, it, it's They're now, I think they've won six in a row now. Yep. Um, I would not be surprised if PG, Kawhi, and someone else, maybe Beverly or... Lou Williams, I mean, he rests tonight against San Antonio. Kawhi almost for sure, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd, be, I'd be surprised if he played. Yeah. Although, he, the interesting thing about him is he's played now 29 minutes or less in the last three. Oh, they play Memphis tonight, San Antonio's Friday. So, yeah, I think they'll, they'll probably rest him. Yeah, that's a cakewalk. Um, the West is starting to, before we get into buy low, sell high, because that's what you and I are doing. Uh, that's our that's our segment. You got to give the people what they want. First of yeah. all, you can follow Brandon on Twitter at BD Marcus. A lot of you did over the last week. Um, yeah. So either the love for buy low, sell high is hot, or you've been answering a butt ton of questions over the last week, too. <laughs> Keeping yeah, you busy. I have. I woke up 13 notifications, got a conversation going back and forth with some other hoop ballers. Um, I've had a couple of people that continue to ask me questions, so I appreciate that. Got one this morning. Speaking of Porzingis, Porzingis for Adebayo. I said right now I prefer Bam, but if you need yeah. the three, Porzingis. But uh, Bam. yeah, Bam right now is the guy that I'm going with. I'm with you on that one. The other thing I wanted to talk about before we dive into buy low, sell high is, you know, we're talking about the Clippers, six-game win streak. Nuggets, six-game win streak. Lakers, eight-game win streak. The West is starting to look more like the West we expected, with maybe the exception of... You know, the seven and eight seeds appear to be up for grabs as opposed to just the eight. But those top six, uh, it's it's starting to come into focus a little bit. It feels like there's, you know, I don't know that you can call it an upper, like a six-team echelon at the top. But right now, it's not that far from the truth. Are we, are we finally seeing now we're a month and change into the year, things are kind of settling in a bit? Yeah, I'm not sure we expected Dallas to be in there. Um, and they're sitting there as the four seed at the moment. 
And yeah, there I'm may be a sure. fade coming. There may be a Mavericks fade coming at some point. Well, yeah, same with uh, Minnesota and Phoenix, which we weren't really sure about. But it seems like there are teams that are – Phoenix is a team that has a possibility of staying in there. I mean, Aiton comes back in a couple of weeks. And you look at Sacramento, OKC, New Orleans, Portland, those guys don't scare you very much. No, and the Spurs are horrible this year. Yeah, and, and Golden State's terrible. I mean, there are people that had them as the eighth seed, but Tank. they're just clearly dreadful. Yeah, they're tanking. That was they're in full tank mode. They're three and fifteen. Three and fifteen. Did you see the end of their most recent ball game? They were up ten with three minutes to go, and they lost. Was that the one with uh, uh, OKC? Oh no, I didn't see that one. Yeah, it was brutal. They got so outscored something like twenty-two to five over the last five minutes of that game. <laughs> well, I mean, we saw I saw Levine. Levine get this. They got the steal, and then Levine hit the three. Oh, uh, that was. Uh, Six points in three minutes or three seconds, rather, whatever it was. Who the hell was that? I don't think that was against the Warriors, though, was it? No, at Memphis. It might have been. Let's yeah, figure this bad. out. It was uh, Charlotte, actually, the Hornets. Charlotte. I knew yeah. it was a team that looked like that. Those yeah, <laughs> some, some bottom feeder. Um, okay, so things starting to come into focus a little bit. you got, like, nine teams fighting for those last two playoff spots, but it is... You know, Jazz, Rockets, Clippers, Nuggets, Lakers. And those are the teams that everybody knew would be up near the top. And then uh, I personally thought the Mavs would be one of the teams fighting for the eight. Right now, they look like they're cut above that. Um, we'll see if teams change the way they play Doncic. Um, and it obviously depends a bit on personnel. Hey, I want to do one uh, buy low guy before I turn it over to you on this list. Uh, normally, I just say, hey, Brandon, who you got? But I want to talk I want to talk Nikola Jokic this week. You You down for a little Jokic chatter? Yeah, big time, big time. I was telling you last night as we were starting to uh, plan for the show, because, yes, we planned for this show. And I was saying how this is the guy that I'm trying to trade for, possibly. So Yeah. Uh, um, he had eight points and 20 rebounds in yesterday's ball ballgame. Um, and, sure, the rebounds jump out at you as, obviously, 20 is a nice number there. But he's still sitting at 34. And sort of the longer that he chills in the 30s, the longer he chills as a third-round pick, the cheaper he gets. Right. Like, how you know, everybody that's everybody that's holding is waiting for that, you know, that month long blitz. And he had like he had a game in there where he looked really damn good. It was their win over Boston, uh, 18, yeah. 16 and 10, three steals and a block in that one. Uh, yeah. But overall, you know, not a ton of triple doubles, assists, boards, points. Everything is down for him season over season. What is the argument for buying low? And you know, by the way, I'm on that side with you. But let's let's just sort of talk it through. What is the argument for buying low on him right now? That his assists will go up and that his field goal percentage will go up. Um, I mean, yeah, his I field goal that. percentage right now is 46.7. <laughs> Last year is 51.1. The year before that, 49.9. The year before that, 57.8. Yeah, 46.7 does not feel like it's going to stick. Um, he's not... He's not farther away from the bucket, really. You know, he's been between three and a half and four three pointers a game for basically three seasons in a row. It's just nothing's going in for him right now. He goes on. Yeah, runs. the one issue. I'll... Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> too polite. <laughs> Politeness pod. Two K to two K nineteen. Uh, yeah, I mean, he'll go on a run. There was a stretch I think two years ago where he shot sixty percent or better in like nine consecutive ball games. Um, so I'm hundred percent with you. I think field goal percent like you said, is a big one. Um, his three-point percent is actually down six from last year and 15 from the year before that, if you were going to look at that as a possible number. His free throw percent is five below his career mark. Uh, steals and blocks are both down from last year. Assists are down. Rebounds are actually actually um, pretty tight after that 20-board game yesterday. And then scoring, I don't know that the scoring comes back all the way, maybe halfway to where he was last year, which I believe last year put him at like right around number 10 or 11 on a per game basis. But for a big old fatty, he's awfully durable. The question now, Brandon, I think this is the hard part. I think most people agree that he's a buy low. The question mm -hmm. is, what can you send out to get him? Because somebody, yeah, somebody spent a first rounder on this dude. And the, the thing is, are there. Actually, are they actually going to sell him low? That's the question because it seems like that's not the case. The guy is Jokic in one of my leagues. I've tried trading for him. He said, I'm going to have to get a top 15 guy back. And that's understandable because, I mean, Jokic was still a top 10. Um, but 
in one of those situations, I mean, you want to maybe give out two third rounders in return for him and see what you can get back. But it's a difficult situation because it's always hard trading for a guy that's a first round pick because owners don't want to give him up. No, they don't. Nor should they. I mean, if they're wise, they'll squat on him. You know, you want someone who's going to finally say, okay, he's just not going to be a first rounder this year. You need that that guy. So that's not, to me, that that's not a ubiquitous thing. I, I think in a lot of leagues you're looking at, so this is one of the caveats to the buy low, sell high discussion is sometimes you just can't. Um, if you could, let's now go in a little bit of a hypothetical. How can you make it sweet enough for the guy who's just like, I, I want to squat on this dude. It's going to take damn close to what I paid for him on draft day to get him off of my team. Who are the guys that get that job done? Let me throw a few names at you. Mm-hmm. The, and these are generally either guys that were, were drafted just behind him and are sort of steady state or guys that are overperforming drafted a little farther down the list. Um, let's start with a mega overperformer. Jonathan Isaac, that's probably not enough, right? No. Okay. Um, what about Drummond? Yeah, that was going to be the next one on my list. Um, I'm actually probably sticking with Drummond, believe it or not. Really? Yeah. He was, he on a, on a per-game basis last year, he was actually better than Jokic for the final two months of the year. And he's in a contract season. Um, I, think, I think they end up on a per-game basis. I think they end up within three slots of one another. Does it bother you that he's averaging four turnovers per game? Um, and that, to my brother's frustration, I mentioned him last week, the, he's getting a lot of fouls early in games. And because of that, he's not reaching his full um, value. Yeah, he's almost a buy low in that respect because that's not going to continue all season long. Like The, fa- the turnovers are insane. Um, you know, but at the same time, Blake is back. Yeah, Blake is terrible, though. How, but he's but Blake awful. is still taking usage. That's the thing. I'm okay with that. I don't need I don't need massive usage from Andre Drummond. I need him out there just playing his minutes, getting his steals and blocks, getting his rebounds, uh, and he'll sort of fall face first into like 15 to 18 points. Okay, interesting. I think I'd rather have Jokic, but that's close. Yeah, very close. Um, Pascal Siakam, probably Jokic, right? Yes. All right, so maybe that's a guy you float out there. Yeah, I mean, because if you look at Siakam, you're like, oh, man, he's having a great year. He's at 18. Mm-hmm. Yep. So it's not like he's top 15 right now. No, but maybe you throw him with, like, a top 75 guy. That might be enough to get it done. Uh, I'm not even going to mention Freddie Van Fleet because that clearly is not enough. Um, Clint Capella, along with maybe, like, a top 90 guy? Maybe. Right? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Bradley Beal, one for one. Where do you go with this one? I think I'd rather have right now. I'd rather have Beal. But that being said, if your team is really good, you know you're gonna make the playoffs. I would say Jokic because I'm not sure that the Wizards are gonna be around at the end, and Beal may be sitting. Yeah, I'm with you on Beal. Um, I don't think that's. I think you're giving up too much in that spot. Dude's playing like, <laughs> like 37 to 40 minutes a game anytime it's a competitive ball game. Yeah, I mean, he's averaging damn near 29 points a game with seven assists and hitting almost three get threes a game. And on top of that, he actually has a positive defensive stat regression likely coming. He's low in steals and blocks compared to his career mark. So those yeah. could actually come back. He's, uh, yeah, I, I think I'd rather have Beal just for the the fact that his team is playing an insane tempo. Um, and he's he's actually due to to finish a little bit higher than he is right now, too. Do you know Capella's free throw percentage, by the way? It's like 40-something. 44? It's 44. Yeah. I mean, and he's 20 right now. That's crazy. Yeah, luckily he doesn't take almost any, which is weird. Someone should be fouling him. Yeah, he should be hitting him every single time he goes up for a dunk. Yep. Don't let let him get those two because he he would average .8 every time he goes to .9 if he goes to the free throw line twice. Uh, You save up 1.1 points every time you commit a shooting foul. You just can't let him finish. That's the key there. Um Vooch versus Jokic. This, I think, I saved this one because this, to me, was maybe the most compelling one I could come up with. Oh, really? I would have Jok- Jokic in by a mile. Yeah, um, it's Jokic because Vooch is, is hurt right now. Um, but in sort of a weird little caveat, last year, 
they were right next to one another. Vooch was number 12 on a per game. Jokic was number 13 on a per game. Vooch was actually in front of him by one slot. Yeah, I think Jokic is the better player. Okay, so you would then... If you had Jokic, Vooch would not be enough to move the needle for you, is what I'm hearing. Correct. All right. I think I'd... I think I'd lob that out there just to see what would happen. Now, you probably need Vooch to come back healthy before that actually works. Um, but anyway, something I thought was worth bringing up. Okay, here's uh, let me throw one last one at you. And he's another guy who's hurt right now. Uh, or two guys. Actually. I got two more, and then we're going to move on to our next guy. Kemba hmm. Walker, is that enough? No. No. Kemba and maybe like a top 75. And then here's one, a real buzzy one. And his rank is low largely because of turnovers, and that's Trey Young. You think that's enough to get it done? No. I don't either. But, but I'm still valuing him as a top 10 guy. That's the thing. That's my problem. If I owned him, it would be different. Um, but, yeah, I'm still valuing him at that top 10 mark. But, yeah, I don't think it's enough. Okay. All right. Who's next on the list? Who do you want? Where do you want to go next? Well, why don't we do a sell high and something that someone that you can maybe put in a deal for Joker with somebody else? Um, with like a big, perhaps. I know this has got someone that you love. Um, you loved before the season. I'm gonna put Chris Paul on there. Oh and yeah. The reason why I'm saying he's a sell high. He's been performing very well thus far. Right now, 22 is, baby. Yeah, he's at 22. He's gonna get hurt. It's that simple. Um, he's playing yeah. one minute less per than, per game than he has been in the past. One minute's not gonna save him. But he's playing 31 minutes per game. He's been great, no doubt about it. He's shooting the ball really well. Um, and I'm going to put him as a sell high because he's going to get hurt. And I think the Thunder are going to hand the reins over to SGA at some point. So I would put at CP3 along with some other big for a guy like Joker. Yeah, I'm okay with that. Paul's actually been number eight over the last two weeks. That's... Uh... I feel I feel good about that one. I will feel less I will feel less good about that one when he does ultimately pull a hamstring because it it's gonna happen. Um, the fact that he's played in what all but one of their games so far is a massive victory in for all of my Chris Paul draftings. Um, I I honestly hope that they give him a rest day here in the next one or two games. Just please try. Don't don't push it, guys. Yeah. Just come on. Don't don't do anything stupid. He's been awesome. His steals are crazy high. Turnovers are coming down after that the slow start there. Uh free throw percent is back near his career mark. This was all the stuff that that we were looking at when I said I'm drafting the crap out of Chris Paul because last year in Houston he had all these numbers that were way below his career mark precisely because Houston pushed him off of anywhere he was comfortable. They were like no more elbow jumpers, only threes. All threes all the time. Uh, and show his shooting percentage went way down. He's a, he's attempting almost two fewer three-pointers per game this season. Uh, and one and a half shots less, actually. So he's doing it all with lower volume. This is more like the the Chris Paul from seasons past. So I'm with you, yeah. I mean, I'd, I'd flick him out there as a one-for-one one for Jokic and see if the person bites. And if they don't, which they probably won't, then you you know you roll down your list and maybe you throw in like a Luke Kennard type or a Evan Fournier or a Bogdan Bogdanovich or somebody that's running hot in that seventy to eighty range. That might be enough to get it done, actually. Yeah, uh, I think I me mean, if you were able to put Chris Paul in a deal for maybe a guy like Kemba, I think I'd rather have Kemba rest of the season. Man, uh, Kemba, can you believe he's he's expected to play tonight? That's crazy. It's awesome. I needed that so badly. Uh, <laughs> on the team that I have Aiton and the team that I had Isaac hurt and I've had everybody hurt and their mother getting hurt. It's I, I needed that so badly. Well, congratulations to Kemba because that looked like it was going to be way worse. Um, yeah. That's a colossal bullet dodged and great news for him. Great news for fantasy owners. Great news for those who like good players actually um, being on the court. Uh, okay. All right, fair enough. So uh, the reason that I was looking at some of those guys in that that 70 to 80 range is that I feel like you can find guys in that group that could also taper off um, as potential combo guys. You could throw them in with a Siakam, a Van Vliet, a Chris Paul. Some of those guys we just said were not quite enough to score a Jokic, uh, but pretty damn close. And they're, they're not replaceable it's not a simple one like, oh, you know, I'll just trade away Nerland's Noel, who's been awesome and could even be better. 
Uh, by the way, I don't think I'd trade him away for almost anything at this point. But the point is, it, it would take a little effort to replace what someone like a... Who else is in that range? Tristan Thompson or Kendrick Nunn is doing for your team. But yeah. if that's the guy you've got to give up to turn Chris Paul or or Kemba or Pascal or Van Vliet or whoever, Trey, into Jokic, then I think it's a no-brainer. Yeah, I mean, I would do something like a Paul and a Mitchell Robinson for Jokic. Damn, I don't think I'd trade Mitchell Robinson. I actually kind of want to buy on Mitchell Robinson right now. <laughs> It's funny because I feel like we're in the exact same situation with him. And he's not on my list, but it's worth talking about him because this is a guy that had a lot of hype coming into the preseason. So I think this is this is a combo episode of us doing buy low, sell high, and also guys that we just want to talk about. Um, but M. Rob, we're in the exact same situation last year where I said to you, I want nothing to do with him. He gets in foul trouble. He's not staying on the floor. All he's doing is getting – Five, six points, eight rebounds, and two or three blocks. And that just doesn't do it for me. It's not enough for the value that he's supposed to have. And then he eventually went on and got the minutes and started dominating. The only difference between this year and last year is that the Knicks went out and got six or seven power forwards. Yeah, what the hell, man? And and that's the problem. I don't know how much things are going to actually change versus last year. And that's the thing that concerns me and why I'm not going to buy him. I don't think he's getting into that top 40 range that uh, where he was drafted. But I, I do, I mean, for him, getting from 70 to 50 is a super fast leap. It's like half a block and that'll get it done. Um, so I, I don't know what it would take to buy him. I don't, I actually don't want to do, well, we could do a deep dive on Mitchell Robinson. I, I want to do one other top tier guy uh on today's show we're, we're sort of doing like two long segments as opposed to you know normally we'll go through four or five guys this is one that i'm really surprised nobody's talking about except for the fact that he had the ultimate in sulfur bombs the other night and that's joel Embiid, who's actually ranked below nikola Jokic so far this year in fewer games remember he got suspended for two uh at 21 and 12 three assists a steal, 1.4 blocks. That stuff is all pretty good. But ultra low field goal percent for him this season. 45 and a half. 77 high volume at the line. That hurts. Uh, and then three turnovers is kind of where we expected. Is Joel Embiid an intense buy low? I mean, are these numbers coming back for him? What do we What do we know here? I, I'm inclined to say yes. Uh, I think the only thing that could elevate his value versus what he ha- what he hasn't done this year versus previous years is he has about a half a block he can get um, versus previous years. But if you look at the year before last, he was at 31. And the year before that, he was at 36. So this this may be who he is. And we may have jumped the gun after last year's top 10. Because if you look at last year, he averaged 27.5 points per game. He's at 21 this year. They have a lot of talent around him this year, whether it's Josh Richardson, it's Tobias Harris, it's Al Horford, it's Ben Simmons. They have guys that can score the basketball and that are taking up the rock. And you also have the injury risk and you have the fact that sometimes he's not going to play on back to backs. So with all of that, I'm not sure how much I would give up to get a guy that has that many question marks. Is it? I'm actually a little bit floored that the Sixers are in fifth place in the Eastern Conference. Are they just coasting? Yeah. Yeah. I thought they'd come out with something to prove this year. Maybe they still do. They did. Initially, they did. I I think they started very well out of the gate, and then they just have started to care less and less. Because, I mean, um, they started 4-0, and then all of us actually 5-0, and then they lost their next three on the road at Phoenix, Utah, and Denver. So they've had a difficult schedule, um, and I mean, recently they've won four of the last five. They lost at Toronto, which is Toronto, man, that give Nick nurse all that he wants. I mean, that guy has just done a tremendous job with yep. Toronto, losing, losing uh Kawhi and then still being good. But I mean, coming up, they've got Sacramento, they've got New York, they've got Indiana. So their schedule does ease up a little bit. Um, and that's when he'll probably take advantage. So there is something to be said for kind of a strength of schedule thing. You know, you're not going to have to play. Jokic and Gobert back to back in the near future. He's going to be going up against foul prone Mitchell Robinson, whoever <laughs> whoever we're talking about here. Um, do you think the people that have Joel Embiid are even aware of how down his numbers are this season? 
No, I, I think the goose egg hurts a lot. I think if he doesn't put up that goose egg, let's say he scores 15 or 20 points in that game, his ranking's not as low as it is right now. Right, it's probably six or seven slots higher. But still, I mean, we're talking about end of the third round, and this guy went at the end of the first round. He He's almost in the exact same situation as Nikola Jokic, and yet... I feel like podcasts and, and websites, I mean, obviously this one included now, are yeah. spending countless hours talking about the reasons for buying on Jokic, and Embiid's getting no attention at all on that front. I, I don't, maybe I'm nuts. I could be totally off base, and maybe the person that has Joel is just sort of like Mr. Magoo and along, twiddling their thumbs and thinking everything is fine. But there might be some Embiid owners out there that are irritated with his bad percentages, don't think they're going to come back, and maybe you could get him for some of the things we were talking about on the Jokic front. Yeah, I think that's more likely. And The thing with Jokic is that he's a safer name. He is. He's one that's been there, and we know how good he can be. And Bede is a guy that is young. He's a pain in the ass sometimes. He <laughs> missed a couple of games because of uh, the fight with Towns. He just runs his mouth. He's got the injury risk. He's got the back-to-back -back risk. There's so many things with him, whereas Jokic, you know, is going to play every single game. He doesn't. He just does his thing. He doesn't have to be someone with the media. It, it, they're two very different players. Okay, so you said no to almost every name I floated out there on the Jokic front. Do any of those guys get it done for Embiid instead? Yes. Okay. Now we got to figure out which ones. Um were any of the were any of the one to ones enough? Like Vooch or let's see, we had Beal over Jokic. So I'm not. I gonna... would rather have Embiid over Vucevic. Yeah, I would as well. Is Vooch and well, if Vooch was healthy, that would be a very different question. What about the guys at the end of the list that we were talking about, like Kemba Walker, Trey Young, uh, Pascal Siakam? Are any of those guys enough for Embiid one to one? Probably not, right? I think I'd rather have Embiid than Young. Would you rather have Embiid or Jokic? Embiid. No. Jokic. Okay. I thought for a second that you said uh, you said Vucevic. Yeah. No. It, I'd rather have Jokic. All right. Let me make this a little harder. Kyrie Irving, Jokic, or Embiid? Well, I mean, it's I'd rather have Jokic over Embiid, so Jokic. And I want uh, Kyrie at this point, I want nothing to do with because these this injury thing is not great. I mean, he was unbelievable, and everyone knew he was going to be unbelievable. And frankly, it's the thing with him is that you know he's going to be good. It's just his injury risk. And now it's Chris Paul's the same thing. You know he's going to be good, but his injury risk. And so the injury is going to come at some point for him. But yeah, I, I no, I'd, I'd rather have, I would go Jokic, Embiid, Kyrie. Where does Jimmy Butler fall on that list for you? Ooh, that's tough. He's at the top for me. I'd rather have Jimmy over these other guys. I think so, too. All right. I, and Jimmy's this is, underrated, by the way. I think he's very underrated. Oh, he's been incredible so far this year, and I don't think anybody's aware of it. He's number nine. Yeah, I, I think I'd rather have Jimmy than a lot of players, and he's not shooting the basketball well. He's at 43.5%. Yeah, so he could actually even come up a little bit from where he's at. Yeah, I think Jimmy's a guy that target in trades because he that's not that's not a big name. That's one where if you were to propose your Jokic for their Butler, I bet you that they take the Jokic side. They might, yeah. And I think I'd rather have Butler there. Yeah. All right, Who Brandon, I got Kawhi or Butler. That you see, I was just about to throw Kawhi in the mix. I was just about to pull on your heartstrings a little bit here. I want Jimmy Butler there. You'd rather have Jimmy Butler than Kawhi. Yeah, because Kawhi, you're guaranteed to miss ten games at least the rest of the way. Yeah, I have Kawhi in the league. So uh, I have Kawhi and Towns as my uh, for my fortress. Damn. Um, and Isaac. Ooh, three yeah. guys in the top ten. You should be probably winning that league. I'm two, two, and one. Yeah, not not in injuries are not great. Oh right, yeah, you got all those other guys going on. Okay, so let's throw Kawhi into the mix. This is our last comparison before we wrap up the segment. Okay. Kawhi versus Jokic versus Embiid. Which direction are you going on that one? Mm -hmm. uh, Hashtag Clipper fan. What do we got? Jokic, Kawhi, Embiid. I have the exact same order. That's the one. That's the move. We just isolated it. If someone has Kawhi, shoot him out there for someone who you think is going to play in 10 more games. Yeah. Jokic, yeah, this, that's the one. We found it. Yeah, I think so. It took us to the end of the show. But we found it. Or the end of the, the end of the segment, I guess. I still got to break down tomorrow's card or tonight's card. Uh, that's it. 
get Kawhi after he plays in a couple games in a row and shoot him out there for, shoot, maybe even either of those guys. So far, has Embiid actually taken the rest game off? I got to double check on that now. He, well, he sat the two when he got suspended, but he said he was going to play last Friday and Saturday, and he did. He did, yeah. He took off the previous back-to-back, but he played in the most recent one. Um, I think there's a reasonable chance Embiid plays in about four or five more games than Kawhi Leonard this year. A lot similar to last season, which would, in that instance, and let we can go back and, and do the analysis from last year, uh, I, I believe that puts Embiid just in front of Kawhi. So I might even throw Kawhi Leonard out there for either of those two centers. Yeah, but you just said you want Kawhi second. Yeah, I rethought it. I th- I think Kawhi's playing 60 games again this year. I think so, too. And I think Embiid's getting to about 65. Yeah, so. Kawhi's turnovers are kind of pissing me off. His field goal percent is pissing me off. I well, it's get- funny because he actually started really poorly yesterday. By the way, he's at three and a half turnovers per game. Um, he started really poorly. I think he was one for five to start yesterday. But he just gets the volume and he gets his looks in the block. And he takes a lot of jump shots. And because of that, he's going to miss some. But he was able to go 11 for 21 last night and save his field goal percentage. Yeah, was I, w- I was thankful for that. That's what I'm thankful for this holiday season. And he's probably not playing tonight, so that'll have to be the last. Yeah, uh, but he's not playing, by the way. This is on purpose. He, he's That's another reason to trade him. I think I'm going to trade him as much as I love him. Um, he's not going to play more than 30 minutes per game if Doc can prevent it. Yep. That's the guy, guys. That's the guy. We've run through all of these weird names, and the guy is Kawhi. Leonard. Kawhi. That's the out man. Uh, yeah, I know you can sob your way all the way to the bank. That was his fake. Ha ha ha. But I'll, <laughs> I'll crying. It sounded like crying. Uh, add BD Marcus on Twitter. Brandon, have a wonderful Thanksgiving, man. I'll talk to you next week. Happy Thanksgiving and happy Brandon day. <laughs> Later, man. All right, let's shuttle along to the monster of a Wednesday evening card. 14 games. Basically everybody's playing. Quick trivia game for you guys you can figure out the two teams that are not playing before i finish this sentence you give yourself a gold star did you figure it out because i didn't i'm fairly certain that denver is one of them i don't know denver's not playing dallas it's got to be two teams that played on uh on tuesday right Anyway, uh, Orlando is at Cleveland. By the way, I'll start by saying this. There are six revenge games on the card because we're at that point of the year, and when there are 14 teams playing, uh, 28 teams playing, 14 games happening, it's going to be a lot of clubs that have played one another once and now are sort of back at it again. Uh, Six revenge games going on in this. Cavs, Pistons, Rockets, Hawks, Spurs, and Thunder all have sort of stuff on the line. Uh, from a fantasy standpoint, we're obviously watching Orlando and how they sort of pick up the pieces here, the post-Vooch, post-Aaron Gordon thing. As I've said before, there are not many teams that take a hit quite like Orlando does when they lose Vooch. That is just everything to them. And so it actually ends up being a bigger issue than uh, what the line might indicate. He's he Not only is he their superstar, but he is, like, there just aren't the guys that can pick it up around him. Um, we've seen some better stuff from Terrence Ross. We've seen Markel Fultz play better. We've seen a little bit more from uh, Mo Bamba. But, you know, I, obviously they just need their guys back. And at this point, I'm I'm probably not venturing beyond, you know, Fournier is going to be a guy that, that gets a look here for the short, uh, maybe even the long term. He's actually been pretty solid this year. Um, I've been I've been liking Terrence Ross. I think that his increased volume is only going to be a little bit of a help for him in this spot. Uh False is probably eh, he's right on the borderline. I, I haven't really trusted him, but he's probably doing enough with everybody hurt that you could drop him into a lineup. Um, and then I, you know, Bamba played well in the last one, but I'm a little bit afraid to throw him out there every game. This would seem to be one where he should get some stats, but he's losing minutes to Kem Birch, even though he's put up better numbers. So, you know, there's that fantasy versus reality thing. Cavaliers is kind of the same old story. The only question is whether or not Kevin Love is going to be playing in this ball game, and you know we'll find that out here shortly. Brooklyn at Boston. This would have been the Kyrie Irving game back in Boston. He just doesn't play when he goes back places he's been. Remember, he never played back in Cleveland, I don't think, in his time with the Celtics. Uh, so for Brooklyn, they'll just keep trucking along. We'll see if DeAndre Jordan is good to go. He's questionable leading into this ball game. If he's out, 
Obviously, Jared Allen just continues to go huge. If he's back in, then we might see you know more of a minute split. Uh, some of it depending on who the opposing center is. Boston, you know, they could go to Ennis Cantor. Seems like Jared Allen ought to be able to hold his own there, but um, maybe Brooklyn goes to sort of the stouter center in DeAndre Jordan. Uh, they they're picking and choosing a little bit. Boston side, uh, Daniel Tice, we'll keep an eye on his availability. He missed the last one with an illness. We don't know if he'll be playing in this ballgame yet, but he was winning that center job before he went down, so I would assume that he slides back into that role, and you know we'll find out if that is indeed the case. Utah at Indiana, the Pacers just kind of figuring out how to play all together here as they wait on Victor Oladipo. They're largely healthy besides Victor right now. Miles Turner is back. Uh, Jeremy Lamb is back, TJ Warren, Demonis Sabonis, Malcolm Brogdon is back. So, you know, five starters effectively on this team. Uh, Utah missed Rudy Gobert. Uh, we'll, we'll see what his deal is. I believe he's questionable for this ballgame as well, and, and they could certainly use him against a very good Indiana front court. Sacramento's in Philadelphia. They've been playing better. Philly favored by 9.5 in this game. Uh, Joel Embiid coming off that weird goose egg his last time out. So we'll see how he responds to that one. Pretty good feel on both of these teams. Corey Joseph, probably the only question mark on the Sacramento side uh, because he's doing all of the not interesting things and not enough of the stuff that is more interesting. And so that kind of keeps him a little bit on the outside looking in. I- I'm not pulling the trigger on anything related to to Corey Joseph. I know he's been number 81 over the last week with the six and a half points, seven and a half assists, one and a half steals, half a block. But... A lot of that was floated by the 14 assist game with two blocks. Uh, that was four games back. The minutes being huge is nice, but he's literally not shooting under almost any circumstance. And I think unless you're in a punt points, maybe even punt threes format, I, I don't know how you make the argument that you should throw him into your lineup and feel good about it. Detroit is at Charlotte. Uh, for Detroit, they're coming off kind of a, a weird one. It ended up in a blowout, um, so that was fine. Derek Rose needs to bounce back. He had a bad one, um, but everybody's due. Charlotte, I mean, they're a team right now that looks like almost their whole team is falling outside of the fantasy radar. Terry Rozier, who I believe is their highest-ranked guy right now at 97. Where's Devontae Graham? Yeah, he's at 106, so Rozier actually moved in front of Devontae Graham uh, Miles Bridges is at 127, but playing much better lately. The big men are not doing enough to get it all done. I mean, that that's a team where you might end up with nobody here in the not-too-distant future. Anyway, I mean, you probably ride with it right now. P.J. Washington is the dude that's getting dropped in a lot of spots, and if he has another bad one, I, I think you could sort of get behind that. He just There hasn't been enough on the table since this whole team has gotten healthy. And Nick Batum playing... Anywhere from 19 to 30 minutes and just basically taking up space has hurt a lot of other guys that were having some fun out there. Luke Kennard, Detroit side, we talked about sell high opportunities. He had another good ball game, so that sort of reopened the door a little bit. Um, The days of him being a top 50 guy for a while there are over. I think you're hoping for top 90 at this point. Uh, He's at 79 right now. So I, I think if you can get something decent for him, this is still, you've got this narrow little pocket to try to get it done because four out of his last five games have been not very good. Low usage stuff. Knicks are at the Raptors. Uh, sounds like Serge Ibaka is likely to miss another one, so you have a little bit more leash on the Toronto backups, but you know I haven't really advocated diving in on those guys outside of a streaming situation. Uh, for the Knicks, Same old story. I just want to see Julius Randle make a damn shot. This doesn't feel like the game where it's going to happen, though. Toronto, they know how to pack the paint, and the only way he's busting loose is if he can get to the rim. And, boy, that, uh, I'll tell you, that's a guy you drafted looking for 50%, and 42 is pretty rough. Miami at Houston. Remember, Houston got smoked by the Heat in South Beach. That was a game where they were down by almost 50 points. Rockets have been slumping a little bit lately. Uh, They're favored by seven, which is a big number. Um, But again, this this is a team that embarrassed them a little bit. Uh, I'm liking Kelly Olenek lately. Sounds like Justice Winslow is going to make his return in sort of limited minutes. He's not a pickup for me outside of points leagues where he could potentially do enough with those bad percentages to kind of offset things a little bit. 
Uh, but more than anything, he's probably going to put a dent into Duncan Robinson and then maybe even a little bit of dent into Olenek and or some of the guards. So we'll, we'll just kind of see who he eats from as he works his way back up to speed. Olenek's the guy that I'm kind of excited about right now. Uh, and for Houston, they've got their starting lineup back together. Daniel House is, is healthy, and, uh, you know, that's the one that I'm always looking at. Clippers on the back-to-back, so you probably won't see Kawhi Leonard in this one. They are at Memphis to take on the Grizzlies. Uh, Jay Crowder has been okay. I mean, obviously, his bad ones are going to be not very good. Um, Dylan Brooks, for me, is on the outside of the cut line. I know that there are times where he looks like he's doing enough to be rostered, but I, I'm I'm not trusting it. The fact that he's scoring some points is fine, but his field goal percentage is low, and the consistency is also a big question mark. So I'm out, I'm out on that one. Atlanta is in Milwaukee. Um, you know, this, this Atlanta at this point is to a two-man gang. Milwaukee is whatever. It sounds like Chris Middleton might actually make his return for this ball game, so that would be pretty cool. Uh, and I believe well ahead of schedule. Although, honest to God, I lost track. I don't have a whole lot to add on this one. I'm just not doing anything with Atlanta beyond Trey Parker or uh, <laughs> Trey Parker, who made South Park. Trey Young and Jabari Parker. So if you combine them, you get South Park. I know that DeAndre Hunter had a couple good scoring games. He just has so many gaping holes in his game that I can't advocate that. Minnesota, San Antonio, Spurs flailing at this point. Um, This is actually a revenge game for the Spurs. Just curious who the hell's playing for them. Who's going to start? What point guard gets to start? Uh, And then does that even matter? You know, is is DeJounte Murray going to come off the bench and play 28 minutes to Derek White's 20? Every day is a new adventure, and right now you're you're sort of stuck. I don't know if you can start any of those guards. Lamarcus Aldridge, yes. Demar Derozan, yes. And then beyond that, you're you're rolling the dice. Jared Culver starting in Minnesota. I am not a believer yet. His percentages are absolutely brutal. Um, you know, maybe those things start to work their way up a little bit, but. He got added in all of my leagues when he got announced as a starter, and I wouldn't be surprised if he gets dropped after one or two games if it's, you know, 14 and 5 with horrible percentages. You just, that type of stuff lights your team up, and people don't really realize it until it's too late. Washington on the back to back in Phoenix. Um, I'll give Isaiah Thomas one more day since at this point might as well, but he's on the chopping block there with that low usage we talked about earlier in the program. Uh, Jordan McRae has been playing on and off a little bit better, but I'm not going to trust in that as well. I mean, this team is looking like Bradley Beal, Thomas Bryant, and maybe Mo Wagner, who's been playing better, but they got to figure out a way to get him on the floor with Bryant because those are the two guys that could actually push some fantasy value forward. Phoenix, uh, Ricky Rubio likely to make his return, so that'll be very helpful for the Suns. They should go back to being decent again. Um, They could probably use some Aaron Baines action because Kaminsky and Sharich are not reasonable backup centers to plug in and hope for the best. Uh, Dario obviously playing better with Baines out. And uh, otherwise, things are are fairly predictable with this team as well. Lakers at New Orleans, Anthony Davis' return to the Bayou. This should be an emotionally charged game. Would not be surprised at all to see the Pels play their uh, little tails off. Derek Favors is questionable. He didn't practice, so I'm going to go ahead and assume he's not playing, but this is about as close as he's come in a while. He was great before he got hurt. So you're obviously holding there. Josh Hart expects to play against his old team. That could put a dent into J.J. Redick's recent run. I'm going to leave Redick in my lineups, but if it doesn't go well, I might yank him out before the next one. Lakers side, you guys know how I feel. Um, With the slight caveat that uh, JaVale McGee has been playing better lately. He's uh, hovering right near the edge of the top 100 for big man stats. So if you want to keep an eye on him or even stream him, or if you're desperate for big man stuff, he's a guy that is probably available after a very slow start. Thunder are in Portland to take on the slumping trailblazers. Uh, Carmelo Anthony had a good ball game. He's playing his old buddy, Chris Paul. We'll see how he does in a follow-up here after uh, the Blazers beat up on Chicago their last time out. Damian Lillard has not looked healthy, but this would be an opportunity to try to prove that he is. And then Nerlens Noel has just been awesome on the Oklahoma City side. Even with Steven Adams starting to look a little bit better from a health perspective, Nerlens is a must-start guy. And finally, Chicago Golden State, the late one. How many of us actually are going to care? Question is not that many. Uh, Lowry Markkinen has looked horrible. Uh, you're going to start to see him maybe even hit waiver wires at some point, or you can go prime for a, a nothing burger. Um, Chicago's horrible 
from a coaching standpoint, from a scheme standpoint, they're, they're just a ton of mismatched parts. I thought they'd play better bringing in a couple of veterans, but they're not even using them right. And then for the Warriors, uh, no Kevon Looney yet. You guys know how I feel very positively about him. Um, this is just going to be the same old replacement crew, and you also know how I feel about that. I, I'm not comfortable diving in on these guys because it's rotating. It's Pascal one night, then Burks, then Bowman, then Glenn Robinson. I, I don't know who it's going to be on any given night, and then when that's the case, you know, I don't have a three- or four-game run here to say, okay, I got my games cap. If you're in a weekly league, you find these guys, you could drop them in there and hope for one or two good ones. That's a very different beast, and that makes them much more usable. In my spot where you have to be so judicious with every game you use, I'm petrified to use any of these guys. Positively petrified. Thanks again for listening, everybody. I will conclude this podcast by wishing you all a marvelous night before Thanksgiving. I guess that, right? Maybe you'll listen to it in the evening. Enjoy the giant card, and we will, again, have a quickie show tomorrow. We'll break down this Wednesday card. We'll probably do it in about 20, 25 minutes on Thanksgiving morning. If you listen to it, great. If you don't, meh, we're still going to put it out there. Uh, so, again, uh, enjoy the 14-game card. I am Dan Vespers. This is Fantasy NBA Today. Continue to hit me up if you want to get involved with us over here at hoop-ball.com, at Dan Vespers on Twitter, Team Hoopball at hoop-ball.com. We'll talk to you tomorrow morning. This has been a Hoop Ball presentation.